everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode nine of season three of Revise and Resubmit. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So, Kim, I feel like I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. It may be a shocker, but I'm not super good at science subjects. (laughs) Like, math, math I can do, but science, it's confusing, there's big words, big concepts, and it's tough. So, folks, before you're like, wait, what? (laughs) Where's she going? (laughs) I do have a connection to today's episode with this. So one of the things that's been so eye-opening through our conversations is the different research that folks who are communication scholars are doing, including research that's related to natural sciences and areas like medicine and pharma. Is it pharma, pharmacy, pharmacology? See, science (laughs) so good. I can certainly relate. Thankfully, we do have folks who do research in these areas and bringing a communication lens into these areas, which is often the bridge to directly impacting consumers, us regular folks who are engaging with products like medicine. Today, we talk with Dr. Ignatius Basu, the department chair of the Department of Communication and Media at Stanford University. We talk all about his research, which includes how drug companies tell us about the side effects of their medicines. Hmm. We hear about this all the time. (laughs) But Iggy tells us about his path from being a DJ. Yes, you heard that right. A DJ to being named the department chair, which is pretty cool and impressive. And spoiler alert was maybe not the original path that he planned on taking. We want to extend a very warm welcome to our next guest, Dr. Ignatius Fossu. Welcome, Iggy. We are thrilled to have you joining us today, Iggy. Thank you so much for being a part of Season 3 of Revise and Resubmit. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be part of this. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Before we dive into the big questions, um, I have to ask and make sure I read correctly. Did you used to be a DJ and a radio host in Ghana? That is correct. Yeah, I was... I was a DJ. I had no training in radio (laughs) at the time. So it was a campus radio station, but it was the station that was the first privately owned station in Ghana. And so we all jumped on there and we learned, you know, (laughs) how to be DJs and, you know, uh, presenters and so on. You should hear some of my early DJ work. It was pretty raw. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I improved as I went along, and that's how my love for media and all that started. I, I feel like we're going to have to have a link to something, some video <laughs> of you being a DJ in Ghana, because that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm feeling very, very amateur right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't a professional, as I said, you know. <laughs> That, you know, I mean, they really didn't have anything to compare to in the private (laughs) station (laughs) arena. So I guess I I, I, I slid through it. Nice. Well, since you are not currently at the University of Alabama, we'd love for you to give us some basic information about who you are and what you do. We call this the rapid fire section of the podcast. Thank you. So my name, as you've heard, is Ignatius Fosu. I grew up in Ghana, so I did my bachelor's degree in Ghana. My bachelor's was actually in psychology, and then I worked in television um, for a couple of years and then went back to school, uh, got a graduate degree in communication. And then after that, I came to the States, so I came to the University of Alabama, got my master's in marketing, and then doctorate in mass communication. And right after that, I got hired to University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. So I was there 
for 15 years. And then I got this offer at Samford University in Birmingham in 2020, fall of 2020. So I have been at Samford University as department chair of the Department of Communication and Media since fall of 2020. So that's what I'm doing now. And when were you at the University of Alabama? I was, I started my master's in 1999. Um, and then after that, I continued with a doctorate uh, around, I think it was around 2001. And then I graduated from University of Alabama in 2005. Don't you love it how when we talk about graduate school, it's all just kind of a blur. And it's like, oh, uh, yeah, I think I was there around this time. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. Runs together. I mean, as I think back, it's been 20 years since I started. <laughs> right. Since I stepped foot on that campus. Right. I mean, I mean, when I started, it's been 20 years, but I left there about 15, 16 years ago. So. Well, we were not trying to, to date you with age at all. <laughs> so, um, so we have to ask, it, you have quite a career, which is just fascinating. But when the young Iggy was in Ghana, what did he think he would be doing when he grew up? Did you have visions of being a professor, academia? Well, I really did not think about academia as a profession uh, for me. I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. Oh, I thought and you were going with DJ. <laughs> <laughs> the DJ was just for fun. You know, it was exciting. The DJ was, you know, to make you popular because you were on air, people hear of you. But really, that wasn't what I was planning on doing. So I was planning on being a doctor. And I found out pretty quickly when I started taking chemistry and physics and all that, that that wasn't <laughs> for me. <laughs> and so it became obvious that, you know, I had to look at something else. And so I really, when I started the uh, radio station DJ thing, I got really interested in media. And then when I was done with that, there was a new television station that had started that needed, you know, people with just a little bit of professional experience in media. And because of my radio DJ background, I was able to transition into television and I did uh, TV production. So I started off as a production assistant and very quickly rose to a producer director in that wow. station. Um, so, you know, being, uh, an academician wasn't really a goal of mine, but when I worked at the TV station, there were some guys who were in the same building with us, who were, uh, part of an advertising agency. And so I worked with them and through that, I got interested in advertising. And so I decided I was going to switch, you know, to advertising. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about advertising, you know, in like have some good education in advertising. And that's why I actually came to the University of Alabama. So I was in the business school for my master's, but I was in the marketing program. And I realized pretty quickly that, you know, there wasn't much advertising instruction in the marketing program. So one day I walked, I was, I decided that I was going to switch to the uh, communication for my master's. So one day I walked to Reese Pfeiffer and I walked straight into um, um, the, dean's, the dean's suite and mm -hmm. I walked into Mark Nelson's office and <laughs> I said, I want to switch to communication. I want to do advertising. So Mark stopped what he was doing. He listened to me and then he was like, you know what? I think you'll be better off finishing your master's and coming over and getting a PhD. Wow. <laughs> I was like, really? Me, PhD? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, he was really confident. He had some confidence in me for someone that he's met for the first time that I was so, so amazed at. So he was like, you know, I think you should continue your master's in marketing. That's actually going to prepare you 
uh, well for our PhD program. So consider the PhD program. And also when I was finishing my master's, there was a professor, uh, his name, I believe is John Hill. So he taught international business, international marketing. So one day after class, he comes to me and he says, have you considered getting a PhD? <laughs> and I said, not really. And then he said, if you get a PhD, if you decide to get a PhD, if you apply, I'm going to write you a recommendation letter. Wow. I was like, okay, then I better do it. And so I, I walked over to Rhys Pfeiffer again. So this time I walked into um, the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies office. At that time, it was Matt Banker. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I talked to him about my interest, and he also seemed really interested in uh, me joining the program. And so that's how I kind of transitioned into the PhD program. So after the master's, then I, I, I applied, I got accepted, and then I started the doctoral program. And that's where the whole academia idea started. And so then I realized this is what I want to do. And that's how it all started. That's a great story. I love that. Yeah, I do too. And and that that gets me um, kind of primes me right for my next question, which is, what is some of the scholarship that you've done? Um, is it in media, in advertising, in TV? Tell us about a little bit about your research and scholarship. So a lot of my research is actually in advertising. So that's the area that I focused on um, during my doctoral program. So I did work with Joe Phelps a little bit. And then my dissertation was actually on prescription drug advertising. Mm. And so out of that has been the interest to research more into areas like that. So my focus really is on advertising policy. Um, Mm. Basically, I look at two, I have two streams. So one is prescription drug advertising and the other is advertising to children. So in the Mm. prescription drug advertising research, what I look at or what I examine, which kind of has evolved from my dissertation, has to do with risk disclosures in prescription drug ads. So as you may have noticed, every prescription drug ad has a lot of risk information. So risk disclosures, some of them have little, some of them have a lot. And the FDA for some time has been grappling with, you know, how much risk information should we have in a prescription drug ad? Mm. And so that's what I, I research. So I look at different amounts of risk information in drug ad prescription drug ads and look at the effectiveness of the different amounts on consumer responses such as consumer recall and I also look at some of the ad response measures such as attitudes and purchase intent and so on so based on that information then I draw some policy implications from that so I have a couple of follow-up questions, and one of them could lead to you giving me a headline for one of your more interesting findings. I feel like as a viewer, when I see prescription drug ads that I'm not able to like skip over, you get 75, 80% risk information <laughs> and you know a very minimal amount of information about the actual drug and the benefits of the drug. So what have you found in your research in terms of that, um, of, in terms of like how much risk information is too much and how much is what you can get by in terms of the FDA? So in, uh, in my research, uh, what I have found is that now basically the FDA has certain basic requirements that every drug ad has to have whether the risk information is a lot or little or somewhere in the middle, there has to be some basic risk information disclosed. Now, um, in terms of the different amounts, so it's up to the drug manufacturer to include a lot more or just a little bit more or, you know, somewhere in the middle. And in my research, what I found was, so basically in my research, I had three 
I, I have three uh, levels of risk information. So I have high, moderate, and low. What I've found is that the moderate seems tends to be the most effective um, on recall, measures like recall and brand interest and attitudes. And so th what that tells us is that, you know, providing a lot of risk information uh, sometimes can be too much for the consumer. And mm -hmm. if you provide very little, then the consumer feels like you're hiding in some, some information. Yeah. So you just have to provide, you know, sufficient information that helps consumers to, you know, make a decision about whether they're going to ask their doctors about these drugs. And remember, consumers cannot just go to the pharmacy and say, I saw this ad and I want you to, <laughs> I want to buy it. They have to, so they right, have right. them talking to their doctors. And so if you want them to go talk to their doctors, you don't want to overload them with information. You don't want to provide a, very little information either. So somewhere in the middle is what I have found from my research uh, tends to work with consumers. I'm I'm now thinking that you know when you when you see an ad and it's got the very quick speaker who is who names off the 30 side effects. Uh, people say, oh, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's only half of them. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so I'm trying to I'm trying to think about now. You also mentioned that you have done some research in. Um, advertising to children, does that also have to do with risk or is it something completely different? Yeah, so with advertising to children, um, uh, the research that I've done, I did with my uh, former colleagues at the University of Arkansas. So what we did was uh, we looked at the uh, children advertising review units. Uh, they have some guidelines for um when advertisers are targeting children, some guidelines they have to follow so that they don't mislead these children into, you know, consuming unhealthy foods because, you know, there's, there's research that has established a link between, you know, unhealthy food consumption and obesity. So that's, yeah. a, that's an issue of concern. Yeah. And so in order to try to avoid some of that, there's guidelines they have to follow. So in our research, what we do is we do content analyses of these ads to see whether they are following those guidelines that have been set by the policymakers. And so in a lot of the work that we've done, we've seen that, you know, these food manufacturers are, and, and fast food restaurants and so on are not really doing that. They are not following the guidelines. Oh. And so we bring this, you know, to the attention of uh, at least in our papers, we emphasize, you know, what seems to be going on in terms of not following those guidelines. It seems very, very similar um, advertising to research in general when we talk about risk to participants and benefits and mm -hmm. how to close those risks. And, you know, if, if we don't, we can get in very much trouble. Um, and it sounds like there are some there's some consequences also um, in the advertising kind of world and practice, which is is a nice comparison, I think. Yes, that sounds good. Yeah, that's true. So, Iggy, if you had to um, come up with a headline for what you consider to be one of your more interesting findings, what would that headline be? Yeah, so I, I, the headline is going to be uh, something I said earlier, which is, you know, drug manufacturers should shoot for providing just sufficient amount of risk information uh, in their ads in order for consumers to uh, make informed decisions. I know that's a really long headline. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so what I would say is, you know, shoot for... Um, moderate amount of risk information. Don't over provide and don't provide very little risk information. That works. We can work with that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we want to shift gears because you had mentioned that you're now in an administrative role just an hour up the road from where we are here in Tuscaloosa. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in administration and was it something that you had kind of had 
your eye on earlier in your academic career or did it just sort of um, sort of fall in your lap? Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, so um, I really wasn't having big goals as to be an administrator. Um, when I started at the University of Arkansas, I, my, <laughs> my goal was to get tenure as everybody else. Yeah. And so yeah. I wasn't really, you know, aiming for administrative roles and so on. But as you all know, in the academy, you know, I guess to a point where it, it's, if you, you realize that this is your time, you know, to uh, contribute or give back uh, in, in an administrative capacity if, if that's available to you. So that's what happened in my case. So when I was at uh, Arkansas, um, it came a time where our advertising and public relations sequence uh, needed a, a, a sequence head, and I was appointed as the head of that sequence. And I thought, well, if, if I've been appointed, um, you know, why not do it? So I, I did that. And so um, I did that for a number of years. And then I got this email from uh, Headhunter about this position at Stanford. So mm -hmm. this, uh, this department chair position. And I talked to the headhunter about it, and it seemed really interesting. Uh, the situation we have at Sanford is there are two departments that merged. So it's Department of Communication Studies and Journalism and Mass Communication. So those, these two departments merge. And so I was coming in as someone who was going to provide leadership for this newly merged department. And that sounded really exciting. And so that really um, was a major motivating factor for me to take this job. And I came in and, and, and things have been going really well. So I came in in, in our first semester, we had a name change um, and there are other things that we are doing. So um, I have loved being an administrator, although originally that wasn't my goal and my plan, because sometimes you hear, when you start off new, you hear these stories about, being an administrator, what it is, and the challenges you face, and all that. But for me, I think it's been it's been really uh, rewarding uh, being in this role. And I do think I, I've heard this um, said many times that sometimes the best administrators are the ones that didn't necessarily envision themselves in that role um, all the way through their career, and it was just. Um, an opportunity that came to fruition, and and sometimes those are those are the best leaders. So I I think it's going to be really exciting to watch what you do in this new administrative role. Well, I, I, I appreciate you putting it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm a great administrator, but I think I would agree with you. You know, um, if it kind of falls on your lap, um, I think. That, that sometimes can make a difference. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a broad question here. So looking back over your career through now, um, what would you say professionally are you most proud of? Well, what, I, what I'm most proud of uh, is the fact that I have been able to teach and mentor students who have gone on to do really well. So I'm always very proud of seeing former students who are excelling out there in the industry, whether in, as, as leaders in advertising agencies, PR agencies, or even uh, being um, professors, for example. In fact, one of my former students at Arkansas actually came to University of Alabama and just completed uh, her doctorate. Um, and so I see things like that, and I'm very excited. I'm very proud of, um, you know, the little contribution I, I, I would have made to the lives of uh, these people. So I think it's very rewarding. I find it very rewarding uh, when 
I I see the results of the work that we all do as uh, professors and mentors and so on. Hmm. So, Iggy, we're going to shift gears on you again. Um, when you were at the University of Alabama, I know you had some time to overlap um, with Dr. Jennings Bryant, and we were wondering if maybe you had um, a Jennings story that you wanted to share. So let me just say that um, Dr. Jennings Bryant was a very wonderful person. I mean, we all... Almost everyone knows Jennings as this mm -hmm. incredible researcher, you know, media effects guy, entertainment theory, um, mood management and all that. Beyond all that, he was a very nice person. Yeah. I got to know Jennings really well. Uh, he was my dissertation chair. I took a couple of classes uh, from him. And then also I worked in the ICR as a grad assistant and the him. And so I had lots of interactions with Jennings. And I would say that the way I teach, the way I interact with students, all that I learned from Jennings, hmm. um, he wow. was so down to earth, right? You would walk into Jennings' office and he would interact with you as if you were his classmate from years, you know, years before. In fact, I'll tell you a story. So in, uh, when I was at University of Alabama, um, I completed my doctorate in four years, but we had funding for three years. Mm -hmm. So in my fourth year, I, going into my fourth year, I really didn't have any funding at that time, and I didn't know how I was going to fund. But fortunately for me, just about, couple of weeks into the beginning of the fall semester of my fourth year, I got an, an assistantship offer from the business school to teach a couple of classes in the marketing program. Mm -hmm. And just around the same time, I got another assistantship from advertising PR department. <laughs> <laughs> so here I was torn between these two assistantships because I couldn't do both. I think I don't think you're allowed to teach as a student to teach four classes, right? And so I went to Jennings and I said, this is the situation, uh, what do I do? And I always went to Jennings for advice on issues like that. So Jennings looked at me and he smiled and he has this characteristic laugh, like he has this <laughs> really Jennings. And then he looked at me and he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> so he said I should stop by a couple of days later. So I stopped by and then he had his laugh and, and he smiled and he said, you know, I've taken care of it. I'm like, what happened? What did you do? <laughs> and he said, I set up a lunch meeting with the head of marketing and management. Um, his name is Ron Dulick, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I set up a meeting to go discuss your issue. And I'm like, so Jennings set up a lunch meeting just to go discuss my issue with Ron Dulick. <laughs> so he says they had a meeting and they agreed. They, they came to an agreement that I would teach one class in marketing and then I would teach one class in advertising PR. And so wow. that was settled. And then on top of that, Jennings says, you know, when we were at the meeting, we were, Ron and I were arguing about who prepared you the best. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron was saying, no, we prepared Ignatius the best. And I said, we prepared Ignatius the best. And that was <laughs> so incredible for me. I was like, Oh my gosh, look at me, <laughs> not really sure of myself. And here's Jennings bragging about me <laughs> to, and arguing with Ron Dulick about I prepared him, we prepared him the best, and they are like, we prepared him the best. So that just gives you a picture of who Jennings was. Yeah. You know, he made you feel really important. He made you feel um, like you are really worth something more than you even think about yourself. So he did a really, really good job at that, and um, he's, I, I really miss him. And in fact, I had been in touch with him even after I left Alabama, and mm -hmm. I had been in touch with him even just before he passed away. In fact, when, I, when he found out that I've gotten this job at Samford, he himself reached out to me, and he said, I'm going to connect you with some people in Birmingham that are going to help you to succeed. And he gave me wow. names of people 
and actually set up a meeting with one of them. Uh, there's a guy called George Elliott who was with uh, Southwestern Bell. He was the head of PR. So he mm-hmm. actually, I, I actually had a meeting with George Elliott, uh, Jennings Connection, and George Elliott came and gave me lots of good information, you know, about, um, and George Elliott had actually worked uh, as an agent at Sanford in addition. And so he knew the area and we talked and it was a good time. So I'm just trying to paint a picture of what an incredible guy Jennings was. Well, yeah. certainly. And that was a great story. Thank you so much for sharing that. So Iggy, um, we're going to finish with a question. We hope that's relatively fun. Um, we have all been kind of on lockdown for a, the past little bit here. Too long. Too long. <laughs> too long. <laughs> it, hopefully coming up, what is one of the next um, conferences or places that you're looking forward to attending when we get to do that in person a little bit more? So one conference that I really miss is AJMC. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, we can make it happen in person, face to face. Yes. In 2022. <laughs> Iggy, it has been such a pleasure to catch up with you today. Thank you for making the time um, to chat with us. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. It's been my honor and my pleasure. talking. Right. To you. Bye, Iggy. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today in our conversation with Dr. Iggy Fosu. It was a great conversation. I know I literally say that every single week. However, next week, another great conversation. Next week, we're going to be talking with Dr. Rhonda Gibson, who's a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We talk about all things related to representation in the media, specifically looking at sexual minorities in the media. We talk about it in a news context and entertainment context. This is a really insightful conversation. Tune in next week.